Good morning. Today we will begin our third chapter on integration and expectations. So, we have completed two chapters. The first one was on probability measures and probability spaces. The second one was on random variables. Now, this is the third chapter on integration and expectation. So, you are already familiar with integration right and the integral you are familiar with is known as the Riemann integral right. This is from your calculus course right. So, when you say integral a to b f of x dx you know what it means right. So, you take some function from r to r and you know how to integrate it over an interval right. So, everybody is familiar with this. So, in particular so you have some function f of x and you have some interval a to b. The way this integral a to b f x d x is defined uh, is by dividing this x axis into several little part little intervals. So, let us call this each of this let us call this delta x i all right. So, this is x naught is a x 1 x 2 and so on right. This is x n minus 1 and then this is x n equal to b right. So, you make a partition of the interval a b into these tiny little delta x i intervals. So, delta x i is simply x i minus x i minus 1 and then what you do uh, so just to give you a quick refresher on what Riemann integral is. So, you you take the following you take define so u n of f is equal to sum over i equals 1 to n supremum f of x over this interval times delta x i, but delta x i is simply x i minus x i minus 1. So, you define that and then you define l n of f as the same thing uh, with an infimum, infimum of the same thing ok. So, essentially what you are doing is if you consider a particular delta x i interval you consider the supremum of all the values taken by the function in that little interval right is the biggest value. So, in this case it is here uh, and you may and then for each such delta x i interval you consider this and sum multiply it with delta x i and sum it over i equals 1 to n. Similarly, for the infimum right this sum is called the upper Riemann sum this is called the lower Riemann sum ok. Now, what you can show is that when n becomes bigger and bigger and the partition becomes smaller and smaller the upper Riemann sum is monotonically decreasing. Is that clear why it is the case? So, if you just if you want to draw a more magnified view of what is going on here right. Let me just draw a magnified view suppose that is my delta x i ok. So, I have a particular n and a certain partition. So, in this case I will have the su supremum is at is here this value and the infimum is let us say that value right. So, in the supremum I will substitute that value for this particular interval right. However, if I create a finer partition with a larger n, so let us say I will have a further partition of this. Now, what will happen is I have, so for this interval for this partition I will have that as my supremum, but this interval I will have a lower value as my supremum 
right. So, when I do the uh, upper Riemann sum with a finer partition, I get a value that is smaller, at least no bigger, right. And similarly, for the lower Riemann sum, as n becomes bigger and the partition becomes finer, I will get a larger value. So, so the lower Riemann sum can be shown to be a monotonically increasing sequence and the upper Riemann sum is monotonically decreasing okay. So, for this sum for these if you send n to infinity such that each delta x i goes to 0 right this sequence must necessarily attain a limit right because this is a monotonically decreasing sequence and this is a monotonically increasing sequence correct for the moment let us assume that f is bounded ok is that clear. Uh, so, since u n of f is monotone decreasing and l n of f is monotone increasing in n limit n tending to infinity u n of f and limit n tending to infinity l n of f must both exist right is that clear any questions on that. So, this is something you should already know right I am just reviewing Riemann integration. So, this limit and this limit def definitely exist right, but it is also the case that for every n u n of f is bigger than or equal to l n of f for every n that is true why by definition right. So, the lim so this limit exists and this limit exists as n tends to infinity. So, the limit of this must be greater than or equal to the limit of that correct. <coughs> so, this limit is known as the upper Riemann integral of f over a to b ok and this is known as the lower Riemann integral of f this limit ok. This limit exists as real numbers and the, this is called the upper integral and this is called the lower integral of f and f the function f is said to be Riemann integrable if the upper Riemann integral and the lower Riemann integral have the same value ok. So, uh, f is said to be Riemann integrable over a b if limit u n of f is equal to limit n tending to infinity l n of f. So, what we are saying is that l n of f is a increasing sequence in n and u n of f is a monotonically decreasing sequence in n they most they must both have some limit the limit may not be the same ok, but if the limit is the same if the limit and this limit are equal uh, in other words if the upper integral and the lower integral are both equal we say that f is Riemann integrable over the interval a b ok and this common value is known as the integral of f over a to b ok. This common value is called so this common value is denoted integral a to b f of x dx ok that is your Riemann integral. So, is everybody familiar with this? So, one nice thing about this Riemann integral is that so if f is Riemann integrable it does not matter how you so, how you uh, create this partition is irrelevant you can 
create equal partitions, unequal partitions, any whichever way you like. And as long as each delta xi goes to 0, you have the same value of the integral, okay, that can be shown. Any questions? And for a Riemann integral, if you have in something like integral a to infinity or integral 0 to infinity of x dx, it is just like sending b to infinity, right. So, integral a to infinity f x dx is simply defined as limit b tending to infinity integral a to b f x dx, right. That is an improper Riemann integral, right. So, these things you already know, right. So, now we, so we know how to integrate a function over an integral with respect to a variable, right. So, now uh, we are going to generalize this theory of integrals, okay, uh, to what are known as ab abstract integrals, okay. So, what we really want to do is to define something like this, okay. So, this, so this primer is over primer on Riemann integration is over. Suppose, so this is called, so we are getting into abstract integration, uh, here let omega f mu be any measure space, not necessarily even a probability space. be a measure space and f from omega to r well actually I can have from omega to 0 infinity infinity included f from omega to infinity b a measurable function okay so you have some omega f mu this is your omega right and you have a sigma algebra on it and some measure on it this may not even be a probability measure okay some measure and then you have a function that maps omega to real line or it can even it some points can even map to plus or minus infinity right that is allowed okay. So, f in certain points can even take plus or minus infinity as values. We want to define So, we want to define the following abstract integral, okay. So, we want to define integral f d mu over a measurable set A, okay. So, you have a measurable function from omega to r or omega to r union plus infinity minus infinity. You want to define the integral of a measurable function with respect to a measure over a measurable set, f measurable set, okay. So, that is what we will define. I have not, I mean, I have, I have not defined it, I am saying this is what I want to do, right. So, from now on, you will not think of integrals as integral over an inter interval and integral with respect to a variable okay that is uh, high school or undergraduate stuff so as graduate students we will think of integral as integral of a measurable function with respect to a measure over a f measurable set okay from now on this is how we will think of it okay i haven't told you what it is of course but that's where i'm building okay i'm just saying what we want to do Okay. So, this is called this is called abstract integration. 
Now, so why are we bothered doing this? So, the reason is this naturally generalizes the concept of a Riemann integral to include uh, more general measures as well. Okay. Uh, in particular, so, uh, so I let me put down a couple of special cases. I will put two special cases down which are very important. So, let us say that omega f mu is, e is simply r Borel lambda. Okay. So, this guy is r b r lambda Lebesgue measure lambda. So, in that case my integral will be integral f d lambda over a right. So, a is so a will be some so what kind of a set? A will be some Borel set, right. So, we are integrating a measurable function with respect to the Lebesgue measure over a Borel set. Okay. So, here A is Borel. So, this integral is known as the Lebesgue integral. Okay. So, it is integral with respect to the Lebesgue measure therefore, the integral is known as the Lebesgue integral. Okay. So, this Lebesgue integral naturally generalizes the Riemann integral. Okay. So, this is like so this is like saying I am going to integrate f, f is after all a function from r to r now. right? So, you are integrating a function. Uh, with respect to the Lebesgue measure over any Borel set. So, here you are doing the same thing except the set you are integrating over is it is it's a particular interval it is not some general Borel set. right? So, what this does is generalizes the concept of a Riemann integral. So, in fact, we will see that uh, there are you can integrate. So, the, Riemann, the Lebesgue integral is defined for certain functions over more complicated sets and it is defined even when the Riemann integral is not defined or when the Riemann integral may not exist even. right? So, the Lebesgue integral exists sometimes even when the Riemann integral does not exist. Okay. But however, the nice thing is whenever the Riemann integral exists, the Lebesgue integral always exists. Furthermore, the value of the Riemann integral will be equal to the value of the Lebesgue integral. Okay. So, in that sense this is a strictly more general notion of an integral of uh, a function from r to r. Okay. I have not told you what it is of course, but I am just <laughs> building up towards uh, what it is. right? So, this so Lebesgue integral this generalizes uh, so I will just say it generalizes the Riemann integral in the sense that this may exist even when the Riemann integral may not exist, but when the Riemann integral exists the Lebesgue integral always exists and the values will be equal. Right. So, in some sense we can from once I have to told you what this is you can totally forget about Riemann integration because this is strictly more general. Okay. So, in the beginning this may seem like a little abstract because it is called abstract integration after all. But once you learn Lebesgue integrals and abstract integrals in general, you will actually feel that the Riemann integral is a very awkward integral. It is actually quite uh, awkward and it does not exist for even fairly simple functions. Okay. Okay, thus that is the first example of an abstract integral, right? It is the Lebesgue integral. The second the second example uh, we consider the space omega of mu uh, to be a probability space. So, mu will be a probability measure now. Okay. So, we will consider since we are doing probability theory. So, let us say this is a probability space mu is a probability measure now. So, I call it P. Okay. 
and I am going to consider a measurable function from omega to let us say r. Okay. Consider a measurable function from omega to r, but what is a measurable function from omega to r? It is a random variable, right? Now, this is a probability space. Consider a, so I will just say consider a random variable, right? Consider a random variable x from omega to r, okay? This is a special case of a what we have written down there, right? Fine. So, now the integral will look like what? Consider I am going to consider integral, I am going to integrate over the whole space now. Okay. So, I this is you can integrate over any f measurable set you want, right. I am going to integrate over omega itself now, omega is f measurable. So, I can integrate over omega this is a special case right what will the function be x d p right this p p is my measure now okay by the way a matter of notation uh, whenever i integrate over the whole space omega from now on i will not write omega here i will only write integral right i will not actually i will do that when I may when I write integral f d mu without saying what set I am integrating over, it is to be understood that I am integrating over the whole space omega. So, let me just write integral x d p from now on, it the omega is implicit here. Okay. So, this integral is of uh, great importance in probability theory. Okay. So, this integral is called the expectation. expectation of the random variable x. Okay, and it is denoted by E square bracket x. Okay. So, given a so this integral will be some number, right? Uh, and this number is called the expectation of the random variable x. Okay. So, I have, so what is the expectation? It's just integral x dp. But I haven't told you what integral x dp is, right? So, once I finish telling you what integral f d mu is. You would already know what a Lebesgue integral is. You would already know what a expectation is. Okay, with me. So these are just special cases of the abstract integral, integral f d mu. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay, so now we will actually go to build towards build definitely defining this. I haven't told you what it is yet, right? I only told you what special cases we have. So I have so let's follow the following agenda for defining this abstract integral. So the so the program will be as follows. So, the program is first you will define uh, program. So, so, define integral f d mu. So, integral f d mu for simple functions, what are known as simple functions. So, I have not told you what a simple function is either, right? I will tell you that. So, this integral f d mu is it over the whole space, okay. then define f d mu for 
non negative non negative f non negative measurable f okay and then you define it for general for arbitrary for arbitrary measurable f f is always measurable okay arbitrary f then finally so finally we will define integral over a f d mu once we have defined integral f d mu over the whole space we will finally define integral over a f d mu okay okay this is the program we will follow first for simple functions for uh, then for non negative f not necessarily simple then we will define it for arbitrary functions not necessarily non negative then finally we will define integral over a f d mu okay So, let us first uh, so let us just first define integral for simple functions. it can be written as f of omega equal to sum over i equals 1 through n a i indicator a i of omega for or omega and omega <coughs> where a i are non negative for i equals 1 2 dot 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 n and a i belongs to f for i equals 1 2 dot n. So, that is the definition of a 
simple function ok. So, a simple function is first of all a non negative function which can be written as a finite sum a finite weighted sum of indicators ok. <coughs> so, that is what a simple function is. So, in particular so for an example if you want to take let us say so let us say your omega f mu is simply so let us say my omega f is simply r borel one example of a function which is simple will be let f is equal to indicator of the interval 0 1 plus uh, some other constant let us say square root of tau 2 times indicator of rationals ok. This is an example of a simple function ok I just made something up. So, this says so you have a finite sum of some finite weighted sum of indicator functions this is an indicator of the 0 1 interval and this is an indication indicator function of the rationals right and I have put some weight here. So, any non negative weight will do ok. So, this is an example of a simple function. So, if I give you some omega let us say I give you omega equal to half ok what will be what will my f, f of omega be? half lies in this interval. So, this integral this indicator will fire is half rational it is. So, this will also fire. So, the value of this function will be 1 plus square root of 2 and if I give you omega equal to let us say 1 over square root of 2 then the value of the function will be 1 because this will not fire then right and if I give you uh, omega equal to pi the function will be 0 right. So, all that is needed is that these a i s these sets here must be f measurable in this case Borel measurable right. So, I can even have crazy sets like Cantor sets here right. So, is this understood? So, this is an example of a simple function. Plotting this is a little difficult. So, indicator 0 1 we know how to plot it just takes the value 1 in the interval 0 1 and it takes values 1 at square root of 2 right. Uh, this guy takes value square root of 2 at all rational points and you have to plot the sum of the two functions right. So, it is a little bit uh, tricky to plot. If this this set were also an interval you can easily plot it right. So, if uh, for example, if I want to plot some simple function so let's say so that's one example let uh, g equal to uh, some so let's say indicator of 0 1 plus 3 by 2 times the indicator of 1 3 ok for whatever reason this is uh, this is the reason I am considering this is this is very easy to plot right. So, this will look like so if I plot g against omega omega by the way is simply from the real line now <coughs> I will get so that is my 1 that is my 2 that is my 3 I will get ok. So, I will get something like that plus in the interval 1 to 3 I have the value 3 by 2 and 0 everywhere else right except at this point what will happen because both are closed I will have 
uh, I will have the value here sometime 5 over 2 or something right it does not matter. So, this is 1 that will be 3 by 2. <coughs> See now you will realize that the representation of g in a certain form is not unique. So, this is my function this is the function I have plotted you could just as well write this as indicator of 0 to 3 plus half indicator of 1 to 3 or something like that is that the same thing right the same function as that right or you can write indicator of uh, 0 to 1 plus 3 by 2 times indicator of 1 to 2 plus 3 by 2 times indicator of 2 so many representations are possible right. So, they are all it is all the same function, but multiple representations in terms of simple functions is possible right multiple representations are possible. Now, just to fix ideas we will say that a particular representation is canonical if these little a i's are distinct and big a i's are disjoint ok. So, canonical representation. So, there are multiple representations right. So, we, were, we are going to just going to say that I am going to consider canonical representations where little a i's are distinct and capital A i's are disjoint ok. So, in this for example, this function if I have to write it in the by the way the word canonical just means standard ok, canonical just means standard standard representation ok. So, this for this function for example, you want uh, small a i's as distinct and big a i's as disjoint. So, I will write it as indicator of. So, the canonical neither of this is canonical why? Ha, <coughs> uh, this disjointness does not work right. So, you will write it as the indicator of 0 to 1 open at 1 then indicator of the singleton phi over 2 or something times the indicator of the singleton plus open 1 close 3 indicator of this whole interval right. Similarly, you can think about what it should be here ok. So, that is called the canonical representation. So, from now on I will assume that when I write a simple function f of omega equal to sum over a i i a of omega I will assume that it is already in the canonical representation. If it is not in the canonical representation you can put it into the canonical representation right. So, that is not a problem. Now, I am going to define integral f d mu for a simple function ok. definition mu for this function is defined as follows it is defined as
So, integral f d mu is defined as sum over i equals 1 to n a i mu of a i. Okay. Now, why is mu of a i well defined? Ha, a i is are f measurable. So, mu of a i is well defined and this sum a. So, mu of a i is some non-negative say bunch of numbers a i is already non-negative. So, and this is a finite summation. So, this is perfectly well defined right no problem right. So, integral f d mu is defined as that ok. So, this is definition ok. So, for example, in this case what will the what will that give you. So, if I consider uh, not just so if I consider omega f mu to be r b r lambda. So, I am considering integration with respect to measure mu where mu is Lebesgue measure. So, integral of this g will be so it should be uh, 1 times the measure of this which is 1 plus 3 by 2 times the measure of so 3 by 2 times 2 plus whatever value that is 5 by 5 by 2 times 0 right. So, you effectively see that you get the area under this. So, you will get so uh, what I just spoke out is just the area under this uh, function correct. So, what looks like some weird definition is if for the case of the Lebesgue integral when mu is Lebesgue measure you get the area under this simple function right. So, if you integrate this function with respect to Lebesgue measure what will you get? You will get <laughs> what will you get? So, you will get 1 plus 0 right. See one thing you should note is that this this integral does not really depend on whether you have a canonical representation or not ok. That is something I have said that let f has a some canonical representation, but it does not matter even if you do not have a canonical representation this the integrals value will be the same. For example, if you have some other say if you have so that was not canonical was or this say this is certainly not canonical right, but in this case also you will get you will first get uh, 1 times 3 plus half times 2 which will be the same value you can check ok. So, it does not really matter whether I am writing things in canonical representation or not ok it is just for I mean it is just for the sake of definiteness. So, if this is not so, this statement is totally unnecessary you can check that this definition is the same for even non canonical representations ok. So, you can just check that this is the same. So, example so examples 1. So, for that function over there integral f d lambda will be 1 times 1 plus square root of times 0 which is equal to 1. So, the integral of this function is is 1. Similarly, for g integral g d mu g d lambda that guy is equal to I can write it as 1 times 1 plus Uh, 3 by 2 times 2 right 3 by 2 times 2 plus 5 by 2 times 0 that is that is ok that is also that is 0. So, this is equal to 4 is not it. So, that is you are getting that area right. So, this we have defined a simple integral. So, so integral for a simple function which corresponds to at least when lambda is Lebesgue measure it corresponds to area under that simple curve simple uh, function right. So, so far so good. So, of course, if the measure mu is some other measure you will not get the area under the curve not at all right. So, far ok. ok. So, let us now. So, do I have 5 minutes? Uh, I have 2 minutes I think. 
let me try and do uh, one another nice example. Well, actually, I did that example kind of. So, I have. Let me consider the following function called Dirichlet's function. So, Dirichlet. So you have, let's say, omega is zero one, and I'm going to consider Borel zero one and lambda. So this is my space, okay, and define. Let f of omega is equal to indicator of q intersection zero one, q intersection omega. Okay. So this is equal to one if omega is rational and zero otherwise. So this is called Dirichlet's function. Okay, so it's simply the indicator function of rationals in zero one. Okay, so what I want to illustrate is so it's clearly integral f d lambda is equal to what? F d lambda is equal to zero. Right? This is the Lebesgue integral. So the Lebesgue integral is very trivially zero, right? Now, what the reason I'm doing this example is, even for such a simple function, the Riemann integral does not exist. You can show that the Riemann integral will be undefined; it does not exist. Okay, do you see why that is the case? So this Dirichlet function uh, is discontinuous everywhere, right? It it has so many jumps. So in any vicinity of a point. So if you are at a real point which is not rational, it will be zero. But in its very close vicinity, there will be a rational. So that the function will jump to one. Right? So it has, it's discontinuous everywhere. So if you try doing the, so if this is my zero one interval, if I, so no matter what partition I consider, no matter how fine a partition I consider, in in that partition. The supremum of that function will always be one, correct? And the infimum of the function will always be zero, right? So my upper Riemann sum will be what? Will be one. My upper Riemann sum is always one for any n. Lower Riemann sum is always zero. So limits. So the upper Riemann integral exists and it's equal to one. Lower Riemann exists, integral exists. It's equal to zero, but they are different. The limits are not the same, right? So the function is not Riemann integrable, whereas the Lebesgue integral is simply zero, right? So you already see why the why I said the Riemann integral is actually quite an awkward integral, right? Because it tries to look for too many details on where the function is in these little intervals, right? Whereas this only considers measures. The Lebesgue integral only considers measures, right? It's defined in terms of the measure of certain sets, right? Uh, the Riemann integral is undefined. Okay, so this function is not Riemann integral. But it is Lebesgue integrable, and the Lebesgue integral is zero, right? But of course, in nice cases like this, the Lebesgue integral and Riemann integral will both exist, and it will coincide, right? Yeah. So I will stop here today.